Hello and welcome to the Gifted Podcast. I am your host Neeraj Mulani and in the Gifted Podcast I speak with elite athletes as we try to challenge the misconception that athletes are just some people who are talented or gifted with special abilities at birth. Every week I am joined by an elite athlete as we try to break down what it truly takes and means to be an athlete. If you are an aspiring athlete or just a casual sports fan, you will definitely enjoy this podcast as I get candid with athletes about their journey, their achievements, moments of heartbreak and most importantly, moments of hard work and perseverance. Today, I have the utmost pleasure in welcoming current world number 1 pistol shooter Zorana Arunovich. Zorana is a double world champion, current world record holder in 10 meter air pistol and has countless medals from World Cup, World and European Championships to her name. Zorana has been at the top of her sport for a good number of years now, and in our conversation, we try and understand the factors behind her consistent and unparalleled success. I'm really excited for you guys to hear this episode. So, without keeping you guys waiting any longer, let's jump right in. Welcome Zorana to the Gifted Podcast today. We're really excited to have you today. How are you doing? Hi, hi, hello and thanks for the invitation. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Hope that you're doing well as well in this crazy times in the entire world like yes, it's crazy. It's just crazy. I don't think any other comment is necessary. <laughs> right, absolutely. And I think that there, there is enough and more conversation that have gone behind the pandemic. So I think obviously okay with <laughs> avoiding that as of Yeah. So, uh there is to know about you as an individual and your career uh, as a shooter so let's start right at the beginning shall we because it is very important to know how the athlete came to life what were the early influences that contributed to you becoming the athlete that you are today so i really like knowing you know the early influences and i know that you got into shooting at the age of 14 What would you say were the early influence that actually made you pick shooting as a sport? Well, I I cannot say that it was me who picked shooting as a sport. I think it was more that shooting picked me, you know? I was uh, very restless when I was a kid, you know. I think I was I was hyperactive and I drove my parents to the state of complete madness. <laughs> I was very 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 active kid. So when at the age of like 10, 11 shooting was definitely not an option, you know. But um I I did um I did a test, you know, of uh, my physical capabilities where guess what? Like shooting came as a sport number one according to everything that I possess and my body type and everything. Shooting came there's a sport number one for me and handball was sport number two. I was I was actively playing tennis back then and like shooting mm-hmm. which is like super steady sport that takes a lot of being silent and calm was not an option at that moment but um after a few years uh my father passed away and he was a great influence for not just for me but for my entire family and I think that things have changed a lot you know It's like someone who is such an important figure in your life passes away and basically um at that point I think I I personally changed a lot, you know. And I was not so active as I used to be, you know. I just think I became like very steady and very passive kid, you know. And at some points I was uh, just uh, spending too much time in my house like uh, I was not excited to go out and play with my friends to spend some time with my friends just to say playing with my friends back then when I was 11 12 13 playing with friends was so different and spending time with friends was so different than what kids are doing today like what their image of hanging out with each other is today you know So we were like really we were roller skating, driving bikes, you know, around the around the neighborhood, you know. And I wasn't just not really into into any of that anymore, you know. I was not really not even into socializing too much. So since my sister was shoot, doing shooting just before me, like she started like six years before me. 
I think it was kind of like normal decision to just follow the footsteps of my older sis, you know. And I think that every younger sibling is trying in a way to to do stuff that their older sibling is doing. So naturally, it came the same way to me. So I was just like started visiting the range with her, you know, and then there were plenty of uh, kids back then. I was just 13. So there were kids just the same age as me. There were plenty of kids there that I already knew through my sister. So it was actually, I started feeling very nice, you know, just socializing with, with other kids and uh, watching my sister shoot. So it was just, it was one really well spent time outdoors. And one day I just decided to, to give it a shot. You're like, to literally give it a shot, you know? <laughs> What a pun. Unintended. Yeah. Um, I, I gave it a shot, you know, and uh, I just did not want to take in Serbia. You start first with rifle, like the basic course of shooting. You start with rifle. I did not like I just I went straight for the pistol and I took the pistol. And basically that that was the first of November 2001. And that was my first training. And after that. I think it was going very smoothly. Like um, I fell in love with the environment, with uh, the the kids who were there with me, like my the way I felt on the range. And then very soon afterwards, it's just transitioned from being in love with the way I'm feeling because of the people around me to being in love with the way I'm feeling when I'm shooting, you know? Yeah, and it wasn't so much about socializing anymore. It was just about being better and achieving scores, you know? So to cut the story short, I think that was how I got into the shooting. And then at some point uh, when I got into the national team, I think within like two years, I really got focused to just um, improving myself in a zone of uh, results. And I think that that was actually the moment where I decided that I want to be the best in this. And very shortly afterwards, like I started shooting in like the first November of 2001. And in March 2006, I became continental and world champion. Right. And in fact, within, like you mentioned, two, three years of you starting your training, you had won multiple medals in the junior European championships, including an individual and team gold medal in Moscow yes. in 2000. Not taking away anything from the work that you had put in, how much value would you put on the fact that, you know, you had a successful shooter in your sister as your partner, as well as a coach and not the fact that obviously she's your sister, with, which is an, an added bonus. But even if you look at her as just a successful shooter and you having access to that successful shooter early on in your career, what value would you put on that? I think I would put an extreme of value to that. Like, I am so grateful to be um, to be able to say that I I had this opportunity to train with uh, the best shooter, the the shooter of millennium. You know, we have a lady from Serbia, Jasna Šekaric, who is five time Olympic medalist, and she has been awarded as the shooter of millennium, and just being from the same country as that woman who is shooting the discipline that I am going to shoot, you know, and having access to her and being able to watch her in real time competing and training has made an immense uh, influence on me, you know. First, there was this first influence that was obviously my sister, but with Yasna and Yelena, Yelena is my sister's name, with Jasna and Yelena together, I think that I was very lucky to say that um, I got in shooting in that period of time. You know, there, there are influences now. Like, we have a very strong team that can be beneficial. Like, even the presence of us, like, having this opportunity to watch someone who is on super high level train, it always for example, gave me a certain boost. You know, I remember when one of my fir very first trainings, it kind of happened that uh, Jasna was training in at the same time. And for some reason, 
I, I, I came there first, you know, I had my own training with my, with my coaches and then Yasna came there and she was shooting. She put, she took a place right next to me. I was standing there for one hour on the firing line. I was so afraid to fire a single shot because I did not want to embarrass myself in front of someone who is so, so good, you know, who is an icon. Like, I did not want her to remember me to say, ha, that's the kid who maybe missed the target or something. You know, I wanted to be great and I didn't want to, for her to remember me in that way. So I was just standing on my firing line and I remember I was watching her for one hour, every single thing that she was doing, like taking all, all in just her entire performance. I was just inhaling and taking it all in. After she was done, like, I really felt like there was this great boost of energy, this great boost of just desire to be even better than, than I was yesterday until I was until that very training. So in my opinion, even having someone who is better than you, no matter how better, like you can be, you can have a shooter who is better than you, like average three points per entire, per entire match. I think that's so, so beneficial. Like having this, uh, this person and seeing them, in their action and just being open to knowing that there is some other way of performing the shot and performing the entire match and not just your way. I love it. Yeah. Even at this age and after so many years in, in shooting, like I can even say in top class shooting, I love watching someone who's better than me. And there are, I, I can be honest, you know, at this point, Ranking list says that I am on position number one, but there are periods of time that I'm very much aware of that I'm not the best one out there. And I know who in my disciplines, who, who are those women who can shoot better than me. And if we are not in the same relay, I really love watching them shoot. It's so refreshing to me. Just taking someone else's perspective of shooting is it's absolutely the best thing. And I think that is very gracious of you and also admitting that shows that you are actually a true student of the sport, always trying to master the sport and not just working with the fact that your way is the best way, even if that has gotten you the result so far. Yes, you know, uh, it, it's very tricky. Um, sometimes you think, okay, I am, the ranking list says I'm the best. I have won last few competitions that means that my way is clearly working the best but it can be so tricky you know it can get you to it can get your head very high but then what happens is when when you lose you go very deep down and I have experienced that you know that is uh, that is why I have this this understanding of of how things work at least in my world I have experienced that I've been very high with my mind. Like I do this very well, you know, and what you're doing might not be so good. And then I had my downs, you know, I had very, very painful downs. I even have them now. So, but what has taught me, like, let's go to the other subject. But what those falls taught me is that no matter, like the victories themselves can never teach you as much as any loss that you survive because you can like you can perceive losses like oh i was so bad like i worth nothing but you can also say aha okay i did something wrong today so what i did wrong i will use in my future competitions as a sort of knowledge not to repeat that thing again like your mind is very super tricky thing that we could talk about this for hours and we don't have that time yeah, especially in your sport where there is no area where we see athletes lash out or, you know, where you see in tennis, people throwing their rackets or in football, people swearing at their misses. In your sport, it actually works in a counterintuitive way where they can't lash out. That will only, you know, further disturb the balance that they are in. You know, and how do you... You know, I I wish there was this this machine 
you know, that you can put on, on your head and just let a shooter walk on the firing line and shoot a match. And then that you can see on the screen all the transcripted thoughts. You would be shocked. Like the things that go through your mind and then you have this poker face that you can't see anything on, on the face. Because if you start doing those mimics and uh, letting the anger be displayed on your face, it would very easily and very quickly consume your entire body. And when the anger <laughs> consumes your entire body and you're a shooter, that's something that's never supposed to happen because that's like the first condition to get a bad score. And for us, yeah, I mean, basically you have like, no, I, wa I was joking partially, but now on the serious note, like, those those things happen you know you you are you get in a series of very good shots and then you fire a bad shot and then yeah you can really stress yourself out but i think it's very important to to actually be aware of the fact that it's only one shot and that you cannot like keep stressing yourself over that one shot you really need to learn how to overcome a single shot, because when you think yeah. about it, it's just one shot. But if you let it, it can actually change the course of the entire match. So you have to, you really have to make a good strategy in your mind and good tactics for every match. Like people usually think that just shooting itself is just like you go out there, you fire 60 shots or 120 shots if you're talking about three positions. And then there is no tactics. You just go out there and you shoot, 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 shoot. But it's not, especially when it comes to air guns. You can have, you have, you have freedom to use your time in the best possible way. You know, there are like tons of tactics out there, and it's important to find something that works for you so you can use your time and your tactics tactics in the best possible way. Right, and. So, you know, with multiple medals coming at a junior level and senior level in the next few years for you, walk us through the transition from, you know, being a talented junior champion to performing consistently at the senior level. Because we, we all know enough and more athletes who were supposed to be the next be best thing, yeah. uh, judging their junior performances, but couldn't really make it for one or the other reason at the senior level. So how do you navigate that transition from junior to senior level? I can say I I did feel I had like, I think about two or three years where I did not achieve any major scores when I transitioned from junior to senior level. And it was kind of hard for me to accept because I was this really good junior and then with very high senior scores. But when I transitioned from junior to senior, I felt like I was this little kid who was on the same firing line with all those dragon women, like uh, lionesses who were there, who were so experienced, who had so many shots in their hands. Like I say some of them had more shots in, in their hands from one single season than I had from all my seasons together, you know. And um, to me, it was very hard to adjust to that change. I had to change the way I train. I had to change the, the amount of training I had. I had to change the quantity, the quality, um, the way I trained. I had to change my mindset. I had to change my expectations and the entire approach to shooting and to competing. And to be honest, at the beginning, it wasn't, it wasn't nice. My transition was kind of like difficult transition to to the senior level was kind of difficult but after a while it's like everything started settling in i think i won my first major senior medal three years after i became junior world champion it was gold in mediterranean games for for me it was important because i got the support from the Olymp from the national olympic committee that then I could make some more training camps, you know, I could uh, get some maybe higher quality gear. And basically in the very next year, I became senior world champion and senior world vice champion. So 
I had this, this like four years entire Olympic cycles, which was my trans transitioning from junior to senior. But in that four years time, I really changed everything. And you have no idea, like in the next, like from 2010, like next 10 years from that world championships in Munich 2010 until today, I have changed so, so, so much because this is the sport that keeps evolving. You know, like you have to, yeah. you have to evolve all the time. You have to change. You have to adapt. You have to progress. You have to keep changing stuff so you can make a progress. But I was able to see many, not only shooters, like, I mean, athletes in general who were great juniors, but they got completely lost in the senior level. And I think that because they were so lost with the results, it kind of affected their spirits and they gave up. And yeah, I, I, I had the opportunity to see that, like, from, from my point of view, very, like, from a close-up uh, in my national team, I had opportunity to see in other sports in Serbia as well. But if we would like to make a message here, I think it would be like, these things are normal. They are happening. And the key is just to really regroup, readjust and keep pushing yourself. Like just keep swimming and things will settle down at some point. It's important to feel, it's important to go through this. It's really important and just do not give up. It's it's like, it's perfectly normal, I think. And in fact, in one of our previous conversations, you had mentioned how as a junior, 70 to 80% of the success is brought by talent. Yes. But as senior to 90% of the success is actually brought by training and hard work. And I think that is absolutely bang on. And the whole reason behind doing this podcast, which is shedding the light on the hard work that goes behind making of an athlete and Quash the belief that all high-performing athletes are just some gifted athletes in some sense. Well, people usually think that, like, when you're at the top in tennis, they say you are born for tennis. Yeah. If when you're born, when you're top in shooting, they say you are born for this. Yeah, you can be born for something. But unless you trained what you're born for, you trained your body, your mind, your hands, in my case, your eyes, everything. Who cares that you're born for something if you don't train that? You can, I don't know, maybe I am born to be, uh, let's say, I don't know, psychologist. But so far, I haven't been studying psychology and I have no clue about the general knowledge of, say, called the formal psychology knowledge. And I cannot say that I am this great psychologist. My point of view is that when you are a junior, I believe that there is like 70 to 80 percent that that makes your score is is your talent, because like, let's face it, you don't work not as approximately as much as you work in your senior when you're in, on senior level. And then you're, when you're in your senior years, you, have, you don't have as many trainings, you don't have those as many um, non shooting activities that are that you were doing in order to uh, improve your shooting. So you, re you do train, but I think that most of your performances just rely, uh, of course, subconsciously on your talent. But then after some time, usually that, that goes along with your transition from junior to senior level. I think after some time, you realize that everyone is training and that everyone that whoever is training more and giving more work, they will have more possibilities to succeed. And basically, as w when you're transitioning from junior to senior level, your talent is not so, it's not playing such a vital role in your senior level. I think that what plays the, the biggest role is the amount of trainings that you have, the amount of consistency that you have in your trainings, not so much the quantity, but the quality of your trainings and the talent displayed in, in your senior years is, I think it's based on how quickly you adapt to changes and to more trainings and to new stuff that's happening around. So when you are a junior, you can perceive talent as one thing, but in my opinion, when you're a senior, your talent is being shown in a completely different manner. 
And yeah, but my general idea is when you're a senior, it's when you're a junior, it's mostly about talent. When you're a senior, it's mostly about hard, hard work and consistency. Yeah, especially at the Olympics and World Championships where you see that all athletes that are competing seem to be born for that sport. But it obviously comes down to how much training have they put in because physical attributes then definitely don't come across as a differentiator and obviously comes down to the training hours that have gone. You know, when you step on the firing line or when you're just standing, that was it was like a super strong moment, super strong memory in my mind. Um, I was, I think I was in London Olympics and I was sitting with my sister in the back. She was the national team coach and we were like sitting and watching relay. I think it was pistol relay. I was done with my trainings and we have both realized that when you see the the firing line, those are all women, I would say with a certain pedigree, they are all European champions, Asian champions. World Cup champions, World Cup finalists, world champions, Olympic champions, world number one, two. You don't have people who are like mediocre shooters. They are all like the creme de la creme, as as French would say. It's like the best of the best, only the chosen ones. Whoever came to the Olympic Games, we have all trained so much for this event. But when... Tomorrow we step on the firing line and when we finish our matches and finals, there will be only one who will be able to win. And now, how will you determine who will win? Like, what is that thing that's determining who is going to win tomorrow's Olympics? We don't know, but in my opinion, it's the way you are adapting to that single competition because... Olympics itself is the same as every other competition. Like you step on the firing line, you have 10 meters, the same, um, the same distance from you to the target. You're using the same gun. The, the target itself has the same dimensions and everything is the same competition as any other, but it's not the same as any other. You like, it's so, it's so mind blowing. You know, when you're listening and when you're there and you're experiencing it's it's like, nothing else you have ever experienced in your life and it's the same as every other competition you have done so far so in my opinion like who adapts to that is the person who has the highest chances to win the olympic games because you cannot say that person trained a lot and that person did not whoever came to the olympic games they are on an extremely high level and they must have trained their bottoms off for that event. You can put like a beep (laughs) on that. (laughs) So in fact, and before I get to the Olympics, I also wanted to touch upon your preparation leading up to the Olympics. And like you mentioned in 2010, you won gold in 10 meter and silver in 25 meter at the World Shooting Championships. That also saw you become world number one. And then in 2011, you won gold in European and silver in World Cup. I'd say that this is obviously very top-notch preparation leading up to the Olympics. What sort of targets were you setting yourself for the Olympics at London? In London. Well, to be honest, I, when I became world champion in 2010, I thought that whenever I step on the firing line, it's going to be so easy. I'm the world champion. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to win it. My God, that it wasn't like that. Like we, we don't need to say it wasn't even remotely like that. It wasn't even close to that. I was so bad. (laughs) It was so I, I needed a wake-up call, so I had a mediocre season. But to be honest, in 2011 and 2012, everything was still very new. And I was so fresh, you know, and everything was so exciting. I was so excited about everything that was going on. And the more the Olympic Games approached, I was more and more excited for the Olympics, not for shooting, but for to experience the Olympic Games. I was training, I think, I have never trained more than for that Olympic Games. I have trained this year, believe it or not, I have trained immensely hard this year. 
as soon as we got this possibility to train after we were out of the lockdown, I was training like I was in my 20s and I'm not in my 20s, <laughs> not anymore. I was aiming for two gold medals. In London Olympics, I was going for two medals. Maybe, maybe not gold medals, I was going for two medals because this feeling of world championships was still very, very fresh. It was very present. I think I was still on the wings of that feeling, you know, I was still very excited over that. And uh, I was enjoying so much. Every competition I was shooting, I was enjoying so much. Even though I was shooting really badly, I remember my first World Cup after World Championships. Oh my God, it was horrible. But yeah, let's not talk about that. But yeah, things like that happened. I was, I was shooting like a very bad junior. My first competition after World Championships, like I walked on the firing line being a reigning world champion. <laughs> my God, what a disaster that was. <laughs> I was shocked. It was horrible. Honestly, um, in, all the in all the trainings that I had in 2011 and 12, everything was just a preparation for the Olympic Games. And I went there with, and um, I think it was only me and uh, Ukrainian Olena Kostovich who had both finals, like two disciplines, two finals. She won two bronze medals, I think, and I was fourth and seventh. Yeah, I was, I was getting to that where, you know, you came fourth and seventh in the, the two disciplines of uh, 10 meters and 25 meters. What was your feeling like narrowly missing out on a medal at the Olympics? It was, it was very... Um, now, when I think of it, I just remember being so so disappointed I think I was disappointed to my core I don't think I have ever felt in my life afterwards such such an amount of disappointment by a certain event and by by everything that happened you know this entire I was fourth in 25 meters which apparently if we look at the scores is not my my uh, better disciplines are uh, uh, better discipline. I, I think of myself as of a person who is more consistent in 10 meters. But for 25 meters, I was, um, I shot 582, I remember. And there were three of us who had to shoot off for two positions. And after the, after the match, I was chosen to do taping control. So I finished the match. I just put my pistol back in the box and roughly like just packed things, just threw it in the box and leave to, to get checked for, for taping control. I forgot my accreditation. And while I was, I was there, I just got the information that the, the shoot off is about to begin. So they checked me and then there is me running back to the competition hall but I cannot get in because I don't have accreditation. Even though there are like three jury members and chief range officer, I don't know who was there with me. I think it was jury. And they are all with me and I'm all in my tracksuit. I cannot get in, in the field of play because I don't have my accreditation. So then there is my sister who is running to get me accreditation. And she gets, I take it, I show them, I get in. It's very formal and you have to respect the rules. Of course, it's normal. But I thought that at that point, when they see me, they will be like, okay, just go and shoot. So I go there and they say, okay, you can stand on the firing line. I was like, I got straight from the booth where I was doing the, the taping check. I go straight to the firing line. I maybe had like five minutes just to calm myself down and talk to my sister. I go there and I'm shooting against I am not sure. I think it was the lady from Vietnam and from against Maria Grozdeva, who is double Olympic champion in that discipline and who shot 299 out of 300 in the rapid fire stage, which I did not know at that point. Thank God. So it's three of us shooting for two positions. So we shoot, we fire the first series. Vietnamese lady, I'm sorry if I if I got the wrong country. I think she was from Vietnam. 
she was better than two of us. She goes to the final. Okay, so there is one more shoot-off series, and I score five tens, and Grozdeva scores forty-nine. But Grozdeva scores inner tens and one nine point nine, and I score ten zero, ten zero, ten one, ten zero, ten zero. I score fifty. Like I think if we were counting decimal scores, her score was much higher than mine. But the rules where they were looking, they were uh, just calculating full points. And then there was me who was advancing to the final. I was so happy. I was very sad because Maria is actually a very close friend of ours. And someone who shot 299 should always and every single time really advance to final because it's an excellent, it's almost absolute performance. It's like perfection. But I think I was more lucky. I, ha- I was definitely luckier woman in, in this shoot-off. So I advanced to final. Hey, hey, we are going to final in the 25-meter discipline, which is not my strong side, but yay, let's go. Let's see what happens. So we go to the final hole, which I, I shot there yesterday, final of the air pistol. But all I remember was my head like pounding so hard because the fans were so loud we don't have fans in competitions like no one is yelling and here it was I I felt like I was in a football stadium and I just could not shake that feeling on the on the on the final day before and then we're coming in now for 25 meters and I like I see all it's like the the stands are full and I'm like sure wonderful yeah that's that's good I don't care about that because in the rapid fire stage, you can't, you can't hear them. Like everything is so loud that you can't hear the fans and no one is talking between the shots because it's very loud for them as well. But then we get to the targets and all I see is a very, very, everything was so dark. Everything was so black. Like the part where the targets were was very dark. The targets for rapid fire stage are black. Your front and rear side are black. And basically, I'm like, I'm raising this pistol and I have no idea what's going on. I see nothing. But I'm like, okay, let's just shoot and see, like from the siding series, let's just see where I am. Apparently, siding series was good. So back then, the rules were you shoot 20 shots on the decimal scores, which goes with adds up to your competition score. That was, those were, those rules were different. Now, when you go to final, you start from zero and you have hit and miss thing, doesn't matter. So I'm on position eight. After first series, I advance to position seven. I'm like, ah, cool, wonderful. <laughs> I am still just, just relying on the movement that I've done like 100 thousands of times and just shooting to feel good, like just to feel that everything is okay, the where I'm where I'm releasing the shot because I I can't see anything. Second series, I'm advancing to fifth position. I'm like, wow, yay, we're on a roll. Woo, cool. Third series, I'm advancing to third position. I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> this is this is this is getting serious, you know? Like, okay, let's finish this fourth series. And I was really stressed out. Like I was, I was so, so um, eager to win this medal because I've trained so much and I was so excited. Like, and I knew I was shooting against Kostovic. That was the only woman along with me who got to both finals. And she won bronze medal uh, in air guns. And she has clearly just without any pressure, you like, she has won a medal in the Olympic Games. It's such a huge achievement, you know? She is going there without pressure, and there is me shooting against her. And Kostovic, she has third series was very bad, and my third series was very good, and we have just switched. And I knew that she cannot repeat another bad series. So I knew I had to be good. And I was shooting, but, you know, it's like I'm shooting, but something is just not not really as it should be and I see I'm a bit stressed out and everything and I'm done with the fourth series and the first thing that I do I look at the screen and somehow I miscalculated in my head 
that it was me who took bronze. And there is this one brief moment where I'm like this, you know, there is a photo where I'm like this and then there are official scores and she's third and I'm fourth. And then there is me doing this, you know, but, and it turned out that I was looking at the wrong target in the, in the monitor. And I thought that it was her target. It wasn't her target. It was someone else's target. I don't know. I did not shoot very good fourth series and she was, she had really high fourth series. So she was better and she won it obviously, but I don't think it would be for me. I, I felt like this huge, huge, huge disappointment because for that brief moment, for that very, very short brief moment, I felt like I have actually won the Olympic medal. And then I got very disappointed because I did not win that medal. And I think that it was that thing, that brief moment that caused all this disappointment because being fourth at the Olympic Games yeah, when you're when you're going for high results, of course, it's you're always disappointed. But from this perspective, being fourth at the Olympic Games, uh, it's I can say it's a success. It's a success for someone who went to the Rio Olympic Games and was eleventh or thirteenth. I wish I was fourth. Like you know, um, at that point, you're like, no, I am a failure. I worth nothing. You know, I've, I was really very cruel to myself, you know, and um, I remember the first two hours or so I was crying. And then just a, just a second, on top of everything, I go to doping control. Like everything that happened was not enough. I got selected to do doping control. So when you leave them, when you leave the final hall, you have you have to go through the mixed zone where you are giving interviews. And since the Serbian broadcast um, from the Serbian TV, TV was doing a live broadcast and then they came to interview me, I think that was the moment where I actually could not hold my tears anymore. And I started crying in a live session of a national TV and I remember everyone was like, everyone was feeling sorry for me when I came home. And I was like, please just let's not talk about that moment. And I was like, everyone was like, oh, ah, horrible. But uh, after that, we like we went to the doping station and I remember like, OK, I gave interviews. I had teary eyes. I was crying a little bit, but when we came to the doping station, I allowed myself to sob out loud. And there were three doping control officers who had no idea what's going on because we were all together. Like I was waiting to take enough water so I could go and give the sample. But I think because of the fact that I was crying so hard, sa giving sample was not so easy. And yeah, I, I remember I was sitting, I was holding my, uh, my head in my hands and I made this little pond, like not a pond, like little, little amount of water under me because I was crying so hard. I remember I called my mom. Oh my God, I called my mom and I was crying on the phone. And then she was trying to call me down because, of course, whenever something happens, something bad usually happens. Who do you call? You call your mommy. And then my mommy, my mommy was uh, comforting me but at that point like I knew I just had to go through all of that and now to cut the emotions on the side the emotional part and let's get to the real thing like you got the emotional aspect but the real thing is that yeah it affected a lot on my future performances because the this the the amount of disappointment that I felt was so huge that I thought that I will not be able to move on like I will be, I will have to take a year off just to recover from that. Um, and I was thinking also of quitting the sport because I was not sure if I can handle another disappointment like that. Um, just a spoiler alert, I have handled many more, even bigger disappointments from that moment. And I'm still here just to keep swimming. I'm keeping swimming. Like I'm swimming hard. <laughs> Because in the end, like things like this, they teach you to like not everything in your life is is smooth and not all the fights you win easily. 
And basically, you have to go, you will certainly go through super hard moments in your life, but it's up to you to see how you're going to handle them. Like, I think that was the first really major moment um, where I thought, where I was thinking if I should keep on doing this or not. Like, I was really, really wondering if I need any of that stress more in my life or not. And I decided to keep on going and I gave myself another chance. And I think it was a very, very wise decision because next year I became world number one in both disciplines. I had one of the best years in my life. And um, I think that the London experience really taught me a lot like seriously a lot, the, this, the, the experience that I gained there, I don't think that I could have gained anywhere else. And that's, that's the thing that, that you really need to know when, you're, when you get into the hard moments that it's normal to have them. And you cannot like expect to go smoothly through competitions, through championships, through career, it's never smooth. It's never smooth. And whenever you think that it's so hard that you want to give up, like just take a deep breath, calm down, go take a walk and think again. I never wanted to... There, there were a few more times when I really thought of seriously giving up because I felt like I was, I was so low I think I was on the bottom with my scores and it really affected me, like me as, as a person that I was thinking, do I need this in my life? This kind of stress, this kind of, this kind of bad feelings, you know, about a sport. But then when you think twice about it, you realize that you have so much more to give and that at least I have realized that I have so much more to give and that I have few more medals in my hands that, are out there and I need to win them. So at this point, I think in my life, the only medal that I don't have is Olympic medal. And for me, it's the thing that pushes me to go to have trainings. Even now when the situation was not good and this year was horrible in so many ways for me as a shooter, for me as a person. And of course, it, it made me doubt my performances, uh, me as an athlete, me as a shooter and my future, I just know that I still don't have this Olympic medal and I need to go and pursue my dream. Even though I felt like in the last one and a half months, it like crossed my mind five times, just to give everything up because ah, sometimes I hate it, but then I'm, I'm still in pursuit of the Olympic medal and I don't want to give up. Like I'm going to keep trying to win that thing because I believe that I deserve it. And I think, you know, it, it's so heartening to see athletes push through the barriers, especially challenges and situations that actually put them in a situation where they have to doubt whether they want to continue or not. And you did. And you saw that after the disappointment, 2013, 14, 15, were all years of a lot of success for you. And in 2017, you ended up actually breaking the world record yeah. in Hair Pistol, you know, that had stood for three years previously. Could you walk us through that shoot performance leading up to the moment you, you knew you had broken the world record? Um, you know what? First, first, I... I would like, I'm sorry for interrupting, but first I would like to go back to what you said that they're like, you don't see when athletes are breaking down, you know, it's, it's very, it's something that you don't get to see. And we break down very frequently and in so many different ways. And what a random person, like the average person just a fan or someone who's watching sports on TV, you cannot even imagine what kind of breakdowns and low points we have because 
everyone is used to seeing you at your best. But what I would personally like, and maybe it will sound a bit weird. I know it sounded a bit weird when I said it first time out loud. But I love listening about bad and sad moments of other athletes. Because that is when they show to me, when they show themselves to me as 100% human beings who are capable of... Um, just rising above the situation and surviving moments that maybe they maybe were even harder than some of, harder than some of my moments that were maybe not so hard but they survived like it's what no one knows is is yep. those moments those moments are not are not available for anyone to see and you have no idea how, how heartbreaking, how difficult, how um, destructive for you they can be. You cannot, even yep. you cannot even imagine. And then you have to go out there on the firing line. You need to pick yourself up and to give your best self and try to be the best version of yourself when you're basically you're falling apart from the inside for this or that reason i'm not talking about like heartbreaks even that like heartbreaks can affect a lot on your performance like it's uh, they can affect a lot but you have to go out there and just try to be a robot and do not give your feelings and emotions influence your your performance but what I would personally love, and I will maybe try to, to make a series of those events, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that none of the active shooters, not shooters, but athletes in general, they don't like to talk about those down moments when they are still active. But when they are done with their careers, they can talk about everything, you know? I would love to just make stories about athletes who survive like really bad moments in their careers and they manage to fight back to bounce back and to be really really good in their uh, fields of play that would be really amazing now go back to 2017 <laughs> um yeah uh, 2017 for me was a uh, year when i was kind of like i was in shooting rehab um, because 2016 was extremely stressful because of the Olympic Games and the, for the process of uh, for the process of qualification for the Olympic Games within our federation, um, it has caused like a huge, huge impact on a few of us. And uh, like 2017 was just me bouncing back and finding joy in this sport again. I was training again. I was training like crazy because I wanted, I was just, I think I was very angry for not uh, being better at the Olympic Games. And uh, I was uh, sad a bit for, for my performance, but mostly just wanted to show myself that I still belong in this sport. So I took this, I took that year, that entire year, just to take it easy, like train. But no, not no, not not so much pressure. Just I I wanted to fall in love with the sport again. And uh, the first major competition uh, for the national team was uh, was continental championships in in Maribor in Slovenia. I went there and I won three gold medals and set the world final record. But what no one knows is that my gun broke on the day of pre event during the pre event. And I was like shooting five shots and I see something is wrong. So I give my gun to my sister. She goes to manufacturer. The manufacturer said something that was stuck. I try it again and it works. But something, you know, something is just, I, I don't feel very comfortable, you know. So I go out again and I talk to her and she said, okay, let's, I'm going to go and take it again. So she comes back. 
I take it, but then something else got stuck. So the trading time is almost done. Like I shot only 10 shots. Whenever you dismantle the gun and set it again, it's like you're taking a completely new gun. I go back and I tell her, I don't know, something is wrong. Something, I feel some, something that's, that's just not okay. Something is stuck. And then we were like both just standing there behind the firing line. Everyone else left the firing line like everyone was done with training. And I just told her, okay. And we look at each other and she said, shall we take out that part? Like, just let's take that part out. You can shoot without it. I said, yeah, okay, let's take it out. I said, okay, but you know, when I'm going to, when I shoot, the feeling, the, 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 the feeling in pistol is completely different. She said, yeah, but at least this, this way is going to be different, but it's going to be constant. Like it's going to be the same different every time. I said, okay, let's do that. Let's just change it. And then I'm going to have time for like five to seven shots just to see if my group has changed. Then that's it. Let's go. Okay, so we take out the gun, like, <laughs> take this out, put this down, put this out, like, <sighs> we put it into pieces, we put, we put it together quickly, I go, I, I shoot, like, five to seven shots, I make a group that's somewhere in the middle, okay, and we're done, and I'm like, okay, so tomorrow I'm shooting European Championships, hmm. <laughs> I did not have very good training, but, you know, in this moments, those things are very possible to happen. They can happen like every single time when you go on the competition. So what you're going to do? Should you go, will you go and be crazy about it? Or will you like have very rational approach to that situation? So my approach was okay. So I have trained a lot before I came here. And this one training cannot change anything, basically. Like I cannot become Olympic champion for one training and I cannot like turn myself into a beginner for one training. So, okay. The most important thing is that now I have very steady pistol that is a bit different, but okay. I'm just going to adjust to that during the siding series and the first two series. And I was like, okay, sure. I mean, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Like I have no other choice. I can either start panicking or do that. So tomorrow, I come to the competition, I take the gun, I fire a first shot and I see it's completely new level of different. Every single shot is the same different. And very quickly, I just adapted to it. That's the part of, that's the talented part of me that really adapted so quickly to that. And I was firing, shooting, shooting, shooting. I was, I did not like have anything. I have one bad shot, like an entire competition. I had only one bad shot and I bounced back from that and I just kept shooting. I was, I had, uh, I had 389, I think, or 388, which was very, I think it was my highest score in European championships, but I was so steady, you know, I just, I did not pay any attention to what happened. Like that's my history. Like this is what I'm looking at to my future. And then I, I got, I qualified for the, for the final as a second, got in the finals and I was shooting and everything was, I was like really on top of the game. I was so yeah. confident. I was so steady. I was so focused. I've, I was so, so, so consistent. I don't remember I was, I have ever been that consistent with every single shot that I did exactly what I wanted to do. And the way I finished, like I, I scored 246.9 and my last shot was 10.9. And like I, everything was, I, I was, I was really perfect, you know? And uh, yeah, it's like that, that is such a high score. I, I've, I came to that very close and even was, or twice, I was even better than that in training, in training only. But so far, I don't right. think anyone was, was close to, to um, being better than even men. So I can say yeah. that I am very proud on that achievement because I was bouncing back from a, this really hard year and from this really unusual, 
well, it is usual, but for me, it was this unusual moment and gun function that I went through so smoothly that I was so proud of myself and so happy because of so many things, not just the score, you know, but the way I handled the entire thing, it made me actually realize that I have matured a lot as, as a shooter, like really, really mature. And how elusive is this state of, you know, being in a Zen focused way, like you mentioned that you were able to do what you really intended to do in that world record shooting performance. How elusive is that Zen state and how do you actually work towards getting into one? Oh, if I tell you that and I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> I'm just joking. I cannot reveal all the secrets, but um, no, no, it's just, I'm just joking. Like you get to that Zen state. I mean, let's call it Zen state, but I think it's just a matter of focus. And uh, of course, it's the matter of moment as well. Um, but everything you do in competition, it's not something that extra- that is extraordinary and you do it for the first time. You have to do that first in trainings because I don't think that anyone on high level can actually perform so well without performing well in trainings first like you have to train so much to be able to have a good performance and everything that you do in competition you first you do that you train that at home in trainings so i don't think that this has any difference to to trainings itself like what you asked me that then or let's call it like being able to do exactly what you want Of course, we are all trying to do that whenever we step on the firing line. But sometimes you just cannot for this or that. Like there are like tons of reasons that you can't do what you want to do. You can't just go and put your uh, your your wishes into real uh, real performance. But at that very moment, it's like I think everything got in its place everything settled down so well everything that i have been doing four months prior to european championships everything just settled down and worked so well for me and along these many years uh, you obviously took on responsibilities other than your sport also to give back to the society and encourage more women to play through your positions as an ambassador for Women's Sports Institute in Serbia. And you're also part of the athlete committee in ISSF. What would you say your roles on these fronts entail? And what are your aspirations when you take these roles on? Well, I have to correct you something. I was part of the athletes committee from 2014 till 2018. Um, I, I felt like in that way, I can just channel the voices of my colleagues and athletes and shooters in general to the higher institutions and the higher position people who want to know about the way we see this shooting sport, the way, the way shooters want to, to, to shape it in a way, you know, just to make this uh, this balance between how it must be shaped and how we think it could be shaped and to create something that's better for everyone. As for my sport and as for my role in the women's sport, I think I have been a very strong advocate on, um, on girls sport and sport for women and women basically being included more and more in sports. Um, um, on that note, I was the president of the board in, within the Olympic Committee that's called Women and Sports. And uh, now I am an ambassador for women's sport um, in Serbia within the Institute of Sports. So our role is actually to inspire and to inspire younger generations of, of girls to be part of sport and to know that there are things out there in this sport that they can be part of you like I was I saw on my on my personal 
uh, example that I can fulfill my dreams through this sport. I know so many female athletes who have fulfilled their dreams through the sport. And mostly today you see when they, someone says athlete, it's, it's right away, it's connected to men. And our own role, our, our goal actually is to support girls, mostly girls and then uh, women as well. Like when I say girls, I mean uh, young girls and then of course women as well um, to enroll in whatever they want because every single sport, just like it is for men, it can be for women. You know, take shooting, for example. Shooting is always connected to men, like rifles and men, pistols and men. And then you see so many great women out there. And I like to, I like to mention every single time Anna Kurakaki, who is one of the symbols of Greek sport, the lady who is Olympic champion and Olympic bronze medalist from Rio Olympic Games. She is such a good advocate for shooting and for female sport in general, especially in Greece. So when you think about that, um, my personal idea is with my own example to support the girls, to inspire them and to invite them to enroll in sport and to fulfill their dreams through this sphere. And throughout our conversations and also the interviews that I have seen so far, I think you are an epitome of a quote, which is trust the process. And I know that you'll be using that to your advantage when you are preparing for the Tokyo Olympics. Yep. How is the preparation going along for that? And how has the postponement affected your training? How is the preparation going? If I go bald, you will know it's because of Tokyo. If I lose my hair, if next time you see me, I'm bald, you will know why. <laughs> now, it's like on the serious note, um, this year has been and still is extremely challenging. Like things that have happened this year, I have lost a teammate. Um, I lost a teammate who was, who was someone I lived with and shared everything for the, fa- for the last 10 years. And it was one of my closest friends. She was also an Olympian. Um, she won co- continental championships, European championships just um, in March this year. And uh, with, um, sorry, uh, with this coronavirus and, and everything, it was, everything was just, everything is so messed up. Like, you know, and um, to be honest with, with everything that's happening, I think the best decision was that the games are postponed and I fully support, um, I fully support the decision because I think that everyone wants to be safe. Like you go, you, you go to the Olympic games and you, you want to know that you're safe. That's the first thing. And, uh, when you feel that you're safe, then you can give your best and, and perform in the best possible way. Um, I don't know if this is going to have a good impact on me, I'm not sure. I don't know how this is going to reflect like all those months without competitions. But what I know is that I am going to give my best to prepare the best possible way and just have to trust the process and trust uh, that I gave my best and see the outcome. Maybe. Maybe I will win it. Maybe I will be a medalist. Maybe I will be a finalist and maybe I will do nothing. Who knows? But what I know is that I am going to really give my best to to have my peak in Tokyo next year. I don't know. I don't know what the circumstances are going to be like. And I don't know what's going to happen in in uh, like, I don't know if what's going to happen in 15 days. Not Let's not even talk about next two or three months or even a year. But when I, what I know is that I am going to give my best considering the circumstances and I don't know, we're going to see the outcome in Tokyo. Right. 
well we wish you the really best for your attempts at the tokyo and i am really looking forward to having you again on the podcast in 2021 not with just any medal but a gold medal in in shoot thank you thank you very much and thank you so much for taking out the time today and sharing your journey to becoming the best ranked shooter so far and long may it continue thank you so much for invitation no problem the pleasure is mine okay, okay. thank you zorana wow that was an incredible chat i'd like to thank zorana for generously sharing her learnings and insights with us for aspiring pistol shooters like myself this conversation was a gold mine of learnings with decades worth of experience and insights packed into one hour it is so inspiring to hear zorana talk about how much value she puts on process and how much trust she has in the process as is evident by her career if you work hard and follow the process success is going to be a certainty and before signing off let's wish zorana our best for the upcoming tokyo olympics and hope she is able to go three steps better than her london olympics finish of fourth and clinch the much deserved gold medal this time that's it for this episode folks thank you for tuning into the gifted podcast i have been your host neeraj mulani a gentle reminder you can find us as the gifted on your favorite podcast platforms including apple spotify and google keep following us on instagram facebook and youtube as the gifted podcast and on twitter as the gifted pod so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes thank you once again for listening and i'll see you next week with another special episode until then stay well and keep your masks on